so generally for the whole process we have a, a controlled zone of residual compressive stress we can induce around that hole and it will typically extend at least one radius but more likely about one diameter all the way around the hole and all the way through the hole. That's going to totally shield that hole from the effect of those cyclic loads. We can apply it to virtually all aircraft materials. For aluminum alloys we typically have to expand that hole by about three to five percent of that hole diameter. For the higher strength steels, the titaniums and the high strength steels, we need to go slightly higher because it has a higher yield strength. We need more energy to yield that material, so it's about four to six percent. We can do it in new production or in rework. So in new production we can shield those holes from the effect of loads it's going to see in service. In a repair where you may have found a crack in service, you clean the hole out, You've now got a larger hole. We need to shield that from the effect of cyclic load. Otherwise, we'll get another fatigue crack. We can cold expand those in repair. We can cold work holes up to about six inches diameter. Uh, holes up to three inches diameter will be a one-sided process. Beyond that, it may be a two-sided process to get an effective zone of residual compressive stress. Like I said, in most cases, it's a one-sided process. The complete system of tools is shown here with the hydraulic pulley unit, the power pack to actually use the hydraulics to pull the mandrel back through, uh, that would come as a complete system of tool. So what is the magnitude of that residual stress around the hole? As I said, it extends at least one radius to one diameter all the way around the hole. The other analogy could be that this outside blue ring, that's the extremity of the residual compressive stress, could be like a big hose clamp or clamp that someone's clamping around that material, locally compressing it. So it's fully compressed. If we happen to have a fatigue crack in the hole, it's going to close that crack up. So that crack will be shielded from the load. It won't be able to open. If a crack can't open under load, it's not going to grow. So the magnitude of that residual stress at the edge of the hole, it's typically in aluminum alloys about equal to the compressive yield strength of the material. Uh, that's about two thirds of the tensile yield strength. Outside that residual compressive stress zone, there's a balancing tension field the magnitude of that's about 10 to 15 percent of the tensile yield strength. But like I said, it's like a huge hose clamp. It's a compressive stress around the hole. How do we achieve or how do we measure the fatigue life improvement? We'll typically plot a, an SN curve, which is a function of the stress versus the number of cycles to failure. And we'll test that in a typical dog bone coupon, as we call them. Uh, these will have a hole in them. We'll compare holes that are not cold expanded to holes that are cold expanded. These are placed in a fatigue machine and we place a certain load, certain stress level and cause a crack to fail and see how many cycles it takes to fail that specimen. Okay? So when we test a non-cold expanded coupons at different stress levels, we can plot them out and we generate the SN curve. The blue curve here is the ones with cold expanded holes. That's where we've cold expanded the hole prior to cyclically loading it and you can see that it's slightly higher stresses. Very typically at a typical aircraft stress levels we can increase the fatigue life by a factor of about 10 to 1 in a new hole in production. The other thing we can do that if you find that under the non-cold expanded condition the fatigue life is pretty much adequate for your structure you can use that now as a design allowable to reduce the weight of the structure because once you've cold expanded it, we can now operate at a higher stress level, which means we can use a thinner material for the same load and stress and the same fatigue life, and therefore you reduce the weight of the structure. And that's typically used as a, as a design allowable in all those fatigue critical locations. The other big thing, very good for high cycle fatigue at low stress levels, is we can virtually double the fatigue strength of the material. Um, that means the stress at which you can cause a crack to even grow is virtually doubled. So that's very, very good for thin sheet materials, helicopter productions, and we have high cycle fatigue at low stress levels. We did some experimental work to see how thin could we make these coupons with the same stress level and see how much weight we could save in these. And this was typical of the results we had. This was the original structure, or the original coupon. Then we cold expanded the holes, and this was the life improvement we had, typically in the order of at least 10 to 1. Then we started to reduce the thickness of the material and supply the same load. 
So we went from about a quarter inch thick material down to about 0.175, about a 30% reduction in thickness, and we still had a better fatigue life than the original coupons. So that's a, a dramatic case of how we can reduce the thickness of the structure, saving weight in design. What happens if we put an interference fit fastener? Like I said, all of those joints where the skin attaches, there's going to be some sort of fastener. It's going to be a rivet or a bolt or something goes in. We need to put those into some sort of interference fit. And typically, if you just put an interference fit fastener, you would pre-stress that hole with a tensile pre-stress. Um, you can't really take much allowable for that in a design case. But if we cold expand that hole and induce that residual compressive stress, that's in the parent material. We're not going to change that state. Now if we put an interference fit fastener through, we can further displace that, that yielded material and further enhance the fatigue life. So a combination of cold expansion with an interference fit fastener further enhances the life of the structure. And we can plot that out again with those typical SN curves and we can look at the results we get from that. That's a standard rim hole and there's a cold expanded open hole as well. And again, there's at least your 10 to 1 life improvement. If we just put an interference fit fastener in, you can typically increase the fatigue life. Very hard to control that in practice uh, because you need to re rely on the mechanic installing the fastener to do it consistently. So it's not typically used as a design allowable. However, if you cold work that hole and then put an interference fit fastener in, you further increase the fatigue life. Uh, in some cases, it may even be better than the original hole or coupon with no hole in it, as we see in a 2024 aluminum alloy. That's about the only alloy it works in. And these are su supported by a lot of testing that's been carried out over the years. What's the cost of doing this? Obviously, there's going to be some little cost penalty going on, but when you weigh that against the life improvement and the fact you may never have to go and inspect your structure, it becomes a very cost-effective method for doing that. And then we compare various other ways of putting interference fit fasteners to improve the life, comparing that to a non-cold expanded baseline with its performance and the cost of doing that, the cost of drilling the hole is always going to be there. It's the add-on cost for doing these processes. But putting an interference fit fastener in a cold expanded hole uh, puts you in this location here. You compare that to something like a taper lock fastener, more expensive for the fastener, more expensive to drill a tapered hole, and this all, then also cold expanding a, a, a straight hole and then installing a taper lock. Uh, not very cost effective to do that. The most cost effective way to do that, uh, the whole thing is to cold work the hole and put an interference fit fastener. And that's pretty much concluded as the most cost effective method of achieving a high load transfer joint in aircraft structural design.